Hello, this is Jack from Teaching ESL Online. And joining me today to talk about a number of things is James Taylor. Welcome, James. Hi, Jack. Thanks very much for having me here. It's great to have you. So um, as I said, there's a number of things to go through. But I thought we could start with what you're currently doing and your background in ELT. Yeah, sure. Well, at the moment, I, uh, I live in Brasilia, in Brazil. And uh, I've been here just a few months. Uh, my partner, she's Brazilian, so that's why we're here. And uh, so I work for a, a, a famous school here called Cultura Inglesa, and I've only just started, so I haven't really started teaching for them very much, just a little, but soon I'll be teaching for them a lot more. And I'm also doing my own uh, private lessons as well. Great. And what, what were you doing before you moved to Brazil? Well, I've been a bit of a globe trotter. Um, my partner is a diplomat, so we've. Um, I kind of follow her around the world. And uh, so I started in Brazil and then I went to um, South Korea, Belgium, Costa Rica, and then back to Brazil again. So in each place I've taught English, but in, you know, in a different, different kind of sit sit setting each way, really. So it's been really interesting for me as a teacher to experience different kinds of schools and institutions. And what made you move into English language teaching? Well, like a lot of people, I moved to Brazil uh, and, uh, you know, I moved abroad and I wasn't a teacher before. Um, and, you know, I was like, OK, I live in Brazil now, so what am I going to do? Um, uh, it's not necessarily the best reasons to get into a profession, but as it happened, it's a profession that I just immediately uh, took to and I loved loved it. And um, and that's what it is now. So. Uh, I always joke if my if my partner ever gets bored of me and kicks me out, it, it, even then I'll continue to be an English teacher. I'm not going to go back home and do something else, you know. Sure. Yeah, I, I got started for similar reasons. And um, I wrote one of my first posts was about cultivating a passion instead of following your passion. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't something that I started because I thought I was going to be really passionate about. But after a few lessons, I just got the bug and been yeah. here since. Um, yeah. So I thought we could talk um, a little bit about blogging first because you've had um, your blog for quite a long time now called The Teacher James. Yes. Um, and uh, what made you start this blog and what kind of things do you blog about there? Well, I started it just over five years ago, um, which is hard to believe now. But um, I, I started because I would ar I'd already been reading other people's blogs um, uh, about, about teaching English and I'd, and I'd I just felt that I had things I wanted to say um, and I saw that other people were doing it and I just thought, well, you know, why not? I'd, ha I'd had a blog before which had nothing to do with English teaching. It was about music and things. Um, and, and yeah, I just felt, I, I just, I, it wasn't so much a reason why I started, but I just couldn't think of a reason why not to. So I just, I just started doing it. And um, I think um, the first proper post that I wrote um, got a comment on it by Scott Thornbury, and so you know if that kind of thing happens, then that's a real like that can that kind of momentum can carry you for a long time. You go, wow, you know, I, you know, I just started and already uh, that happened. So, um, but yeah, I just enjoy doing it. Sometimes I enjoy it more than others, but uh, I've been, you know, I've uh, and sometimes I haven't post. I don't post a lot, but. I'm fairly regularly sort of post about once a month. So I'm quite pleased I've managed to keep it going. And you're very busy on Twitter as well. Um, when you first started Twitter, did you, uh, did you solely post about ELT or was it more of a, like a personal um, Twitter account? So I must have joined Twitter about more than six years ago, I think. And um, very quickly, I created two different accounts, one for uh, my personal stuff and then one for as a, as, a, as a teacher. So the Teacher James account being my teaching account. And um, because it was very clear to me, there were like two completely separate things that I could tweet about. And I, I, I thought, well, people who are interested in teaching are not really going to be interested in my thoughts about, you know, music or football and cinema and things, which may not have actually been true. But anyway. Um, and so, yeah, so I started using it um, back then, and that was how I connected with a lot of people, but it was also how I started to see, you know, these blogs about ELT, 
and and from there that was where I got the idea of doing my own. And with Twitter, you um, use ELT Chat a lot, aren't you? You're one of the moderators there. Can you just tell people what this is um, and why they should join in? Definitely, yeah. I mean, ELT Chat has been going um, for over five years now, which uh, we're very proud of. Uh, and it's uh, basically a Twitter-based discussion, um, which might sound a little bit counterintuitive because you think of a discussion as, as being like well, what, kind of what we're doing now, but you only have 140 characters uh, to, to make your point. Um, but you would, it's surprising how how effective it is to actually join, uh, have, a, have a sort of discussion with someone when you have a limited amount of space, because it really makes you focus on the, the point you want to get across. So what we do is every week uh, on Wednesday, uh, at, two, at two different times, depending on the week, uh, we get together uh, for an hour, and we have a, a topic which has been uh, suggested by one of the ELT chat uh, participants. Uh, we have a vote to decide which topic is going to be discussed that week, and then that's what we talk about for that hour slot on Twitter. And we use the hashtag ELT chat as a way of being able to see all of the tweets that people post on 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 the topic. Uh, so yeah, I've been, I'm a moderator. I've been a moderator for um, I don't know probably about four years of ELT chat, something like that. Um, and uh, before that, I was a participant, and it's really uh, an amazing thing. I think it's. Uh, it's it's a really uh, I've learned so much from it because obviously not every topic is something that I'm particularly uh, knowledgeable about or even maybe particularly interested in. But once it comes up and you get involved in the conversation, uh, it's uh, it's really amazing like how much you can learn. Um, a really good exp uh, example of this for me was a, a chat we once did about dyslexic students, and I had no real experience with dyslexia. I've never knowingly taught a dyslexic student. And you know, I was thinking, okay, there's probably not going to be much for me in this in this talk in this chat we have, and it was really fascinating. I learned a lot that day. So, um, but the most powerful thing about it is it's, it can bring teachers together from across the world, who may be, and I think this is particularly relevant. You know, if, if you're one of if you're someone who teaches online and maybe is self-employed, uh, you don't have a staff room of people you can go and talk to. Um, about if there's something on your mind or something, you know, you're not sure about something, then suddenly online you can get this kind of global star from of teachers from, you know, Argentina to Japan uh, who can give you advice and you can have a discussion on this subject and, and learn a lot about it. And I, I should also say that what we do after we finish the chat is we create a transcript. So all of the tweets on that, on that day are uh, lodged and then uh, somebody will write a summary of the chat uh, just collecting together what, what was spoken about, the most useful links and things. And those are on our website. And uh, so even if you can't participate in the chat live, if there's a particular subject that you're interested in, you want to learn more about, you can go to our website, do a search, and find, um, and find the transcript and the summary. And now after five years, there are hundreds of topics. And, you know, there are... If you we spoke about tests this week, if you put if you typed in tests, you'd find four or five different chats on that subject. So there's a, a massive wealth of, of information, and there'll be there will we will at some point have done things that may be of interest to teachers who uh, teach online, flipped learning, blended learning, those kinds of subjects as well. So I'm very proud to be part of it. Very good. Yeah, I remember a topic which was about online teaching. Um, and talking about you know the benefits and the disadvantages to this, I follow many of the the, the chats and especially read the summaries, um, mainly because the the timing doesn't always work out for me. But it's something I do always keep an eye on and a a great way to also connect with with other teachers. Yeah, and I've met a lot of people um, because I love going to conferences. I'm a bit of a conference junkie, which is not always viable depending on where I've been living in the world, but um, uh, when I've been to conferences, I've met people face to face that I've previously only met on Twitter, and then you see them, you know, walking towards you. And you're like, I know that face. You know, it's like an avatar sort of come to life. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's a really and some, when you meet these people, you already know them, even though you've never met before face to face, and you already can immediately sort of get into that conversation. And that's such a rewarding experience. So, um, so thus far, we've talked about 
teaching, we've talked about um, on Twitter, ELT chat, also blogging. You mentioned conferences. Um, there's more though, isn't there? Because you have a, a podcast too. I do, yes. Yes. So I'm part of a, a team with uh, Lindsay Clanfield and Sean Wilden, and we make a podcast called uh, the Tefl Commutes Podcast. Uh, when uh, we, we did a podcast together before uh, called EdTech Concerns, which was really their project, and I was helping them out. And, and then we really enjoyed doing that together. And at that time, there was really only the only other podcast on, on TEFL that had been done was actually the ELT chat podcast, which I used to do. Uh, and, and that uh, at kind of, I was on a bit of a hiatus from that for a while. And they had this idea for a podcast. And I'm the, I'm the techie guy. I'm, I edit all the audio. I do, you know, the recording and, and those kinds of things. So they do more of the content. I do more of the audio. But uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, we call it a, a podcast for English language teachers, which isn't really about English language teaching. So it's not uh, like a methodology podcast, or you know, we're not we don't do too much in terms of like you know activities, lessons, ideas. Although we do have an activity at the end of every episode. But we like to, the, the, the guys, they talk about uh, different subjects uh, that are maybe of interest to teachers or you often find in course books and things like this. And that can range from uh, stationary. We did an episode on stationary because all teachers love stationary. Um, and we did one on uh, bad language. And uh, we did one about dead poets society. Uh, and so it's just a, a, a way for them to talk about interesting things on that subject. And uh, well, we hope it's fun. That's the main, the main thing, interesting and fun. So for people wanting to check that out, what's the name of the, the podcast again? So it's called the TEFL Commute Podcast. So we have a Facebook page or on Twitter, and we have our website. And on our website, you can go and you can find the archive of all of our episodes. We're also um, on iTunes. If you're a podcast listener, then you can just do a search for us in um, your podcast app. We're, we're in a two or three different podcast apps, so it's worth checking. Uh, you know, we're on Android as well. We try and basically make ourselves as available as possible. So, uh, yeah, just search for us. If, you're, if you are a podcast listener, search for us on your app, and if you're not, go to our website and uh, become a podcast listener because they're great. <laughs> they are. I mean, I, I love podcasts. Um, I just can't get enough of them, especially – Tidying the house, you know, I'm always listening to, to podcasts and learning Spanish podcasts, for example. Yes. Um, good. So that's the podcast we talked about. Let's go into Belter now. So what is Belter and what is your role there? Okay. So Belter is the Belgian English Language Teachers Association. And I lived in, uh, when I lived in Belgium, um, when I first arrived there, I'd already before lived in South Korea and I was a member of COTESOL, which is the Teachers Association in South Korea and then when I arrived in Belgium I thought okay I want to become a member of the Teachers Association in Belgium and I tried to find one and I couldn't find one that didn't exist as far as I could see or if they did exist they were so invisible they clearly weren't doing a very good job so um, so I thought well that's strange and then I, I met um, a couple of uh, Belgian teachers on Twitter and we were talking and then someone, someone kind of joked about we were actually we were talking about how there was no Teachers Association here, there in Belgium, and what a shame it was. And um, and then we were kind of, and then someone, someone, someone joked that, uh, well, you know, maybe we should set one up, you know. And then I think someone was kind of eavesdropping on our conversation because we were having it on Twitter publicly, and they just kind of came in and went, "No, you really should do that." Um, and we were like, um, "Okay, maybe." And then I guess it kind of sat in our, you know, independently sat in our heads for a few days and. You know, I was just, th from my point of view, I was just thinking, well, yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, how do these things ever get started? But a bunch of teachers deciding that they want to do it. So we started to talk about it more seriously. And then we met face to face uh, in, yeah, I think it was in 2013. We got together and we said, okay, well, well let's do it. Let's, 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 let's make it happen and see where it goes. And that's what we did. So we, we've, um, we started just over, yeah, just over about three, three and a bit years ago. We actually had a launch event, which was just over three years ago, uh, in 2013, the beginning of 2013. 
and since then we've um i'm i'm really proud i'm really really proud of it and i'm really pleased with how we've grown because we've you know we've organized uh three national conferences um and we have got our fourth one coming in april and um we um we've we do webinars so we do them most months we've done about i think we've done about 30 webinars now maybe it's more than that it's about 30 webinars uh and we've had you know speakers really from all over the world we've organized two online conferences with uh tesla toronto um and uh, we have a blog we've just started now uh, publishing our own uh, journal uh, before we were doing it as a PDF, but now we're actually printing it, sending it to our members, and you know we've really achieved a lot in a in a short period of time, um, and yeah, I think I think I'm really I mean I'm very proud of what we've done because the team of people that has expanded over the years uh, that work together uh, are just great people. Um, it's it's uh, as as the, I I'm the president of the association. Um, and as the president, it's been a like a, just a fantastic opportunity to work with those people. They've just been a it's been a real pleasure for me, and and I've learned a lot from doing this. You know, not just um, and it's not really you know obviously I've learned a lot as a teacher watching webinars, being at the conferences and stuff. But what I've really learned is um, I've learned a lot of skills. Um, a friend of mine, Bethany Cagnol, who was the president of TESOL France, told me that if you, being the president of a teaching association is like getting a free MBA because you have to employ all of these kind of skills that you just don't use as a teacher. You know, you're basically running like a small company, but nobody gets paid. And uh, it's a very interesting experience. You know, you have to learn how to manage people and to be very organized and uh, you have to know how to do websites and make posters and organize, you know, become a conference organizer, which is a, you know, people get paid to do that as a job and um, yeah, deal with speakers. And it's just, there's just so much to it that it's, it's a real, it's been a fantastic education, the best experience of my professional life by miles. Great. And you, you were mentioning before about uh, learning InDesign as well for, for the posters. Yeah. And it's a good example of the kind of thing, I, I guess, it brought out an entrepreneurial spirit in me, which I hadn't really seen before um, because I didn't really have the opportunity, I guess. And then when it was there in front of me, you know, I had, I had to. So um, I'm very keen on, uh, on things being well designed and, and looking good. I have quite high standards with these things. And I don't think the fact that you're an amateur or that you're a volunteer or that you haven't got any money is necessarily a good excuse to just say well okay i know my website doesn't look very good but you know i'm an amateur and so on i don't really think that that's um i don't i for me i that's not an acceptable excuse obviously time is a factor and if you don't have time you don't have time but uh um if you do then with a bit of work uh, nowadays the the tools that are available to you mostly most of them for free you can create a, a very nice website and you can uh, create um, nice materials and things. Uh, InDesign isn't free, but um, but it, yeah, it's if anyone doesn't know, it's a, a Adobe um, uh, application for creating um, normally used for creating posters and and it's not exactly a graphic designs program because that's more like Photoshop, but it's um, but you use it yeah, for creating graphics and posters. And uh, I have no background in that at all, but we needed someone to do it, and I had the time, so I taught myself how to use it. So. After doing that, I thought, okay, yeah, I can do that. So it gave me a lot of confidence uh, in myself to to learn new skills. It's been very, very useful for that too. Very good. And I um, thought we could just change pace a little bit and talk about sure. your influence in the uh, TEFL equity advocates. Um, and can you just describe what what the problem is and what the problem um, and how you're trying to solve it? So TEFL equity advocates was a campaign uh, it's not my campaign. It was created by uh, Marek Kitschkowiak, uh, who was a colleague of mine in Costa Rica, and but he's originally from Poland. And as a um, non-native uh, English-speaking teacher, uh, he's created this campaign as a way of uh, making people aware of the prejudice in uh, employment practices against 
non-native English speaker teachers. And so um, when I first met him, uh, he didn't have much experience of, um, of the online uh, TEFL world that we've been talking about. So I was helping him out, like letting him know about, you know, things, you know, places you need to post on Facebook and, you know, how to use Twitter and, and like giving him feedback on his website. And, and I've I made some posters for him as well. And, but then, you know, I just sort of helped him get up and running and he's just gone, whew, you know, he's really um, done fantastic work. Um, and uh, yeah, I, um, I, right at the beginning, I decided to write a blog post for him. Um, and it was, and I, I deliberately wanted to create a post which I thought would get a lot of traffic. I'm on unapologetic about about that. I felt like I want to do something which is going to let people know that this campaign exists. So I very provocatively uh, wrote a, uh, a blog post for him called "Why I Wish I Was a Non-Native uh, English Teacher." And that what I didn't realise was Mary was going to put a big picture of my you know, English face at the top of this blog post. So whenever it was shared on Facebook, uh, there was like this big picture of me there next to the headline. I guess that probably helped, but it wasn't <laughs> it was like, okay, I wasn't really ready for that. It got a huge reaction, huge reaction, especially on the British Council's Teaching English Facebook page, which has got something like, I don't know, like two and a half million or three and a half million likes. It's a huge community. And most of the, most of it was very positive. Um, some of it wasn't. Normally from native, well, only from native English speaker teachers, who seemed to really get the wrong end of the stick, as far as I was concerned. But yeah, the whole the premise of the article was basically me saying, look, there's nothing wrong with me. It was a deliberately provocative title. I don't really wish that I'm an, a, a non-native teacher because I have an unfair advantage, and I'd you know be crazy to give that away because I'm British, uh, and for other reasons as well. But um, there are certain things which, as a native speaker of English, I don't have. Like, I've never learned English as a foreign language, which is an extremely useful thing for a teacher to be able to, to have experienced. So that just, I think it's a very basic idea, but if you just have students in your class who need to learn how to speak English, if you've learned English well enough that you can now teach it, and clearly you're someone who can give them fantastic advice for strategies uh, for, for them to help them become better teachers. So that's just one example of some of the things that I wrote about in this post. Uh, and yeah, and then since then, Marek's done fantastic work um, and he spoke at various conferences and, um, and organized lots of great things. And uh, I'm very happy to have just been just someone who was part of that near the beginning and just tried to help get the ball rolling and, and to talk about it like I am today uh, whenever I can because I think it's really important and I think if you're someone like me who uh, is a, who benefits from prejudice then you have a responsibility to speak out about that and try and do something about it so I'm happy to do that. Very good yeah I, I get a lot of um, people contacting me who are non-native speakers um, and they ask you know can I do this am I able to do this because um, obviously there is that prejudice that they've seen yeah um, and i always say play to your strengths and one of your strengths is the fact that you've learned english that you've gone yeah. through this process and you can relate to your learners um and in terms of marketing as well you can market in the um non-native language you know you can actually market to people yeah. in a very um, natural way so yeah. yeah we'll um for anyone watching this there will be notes below the blog post so if you're watching on youtube just click the the link and we'll um, link up to some of these articles and other resources. Um, I want to also talk about teaching styles, teaching methods. Yeah. Um, a good way maybe to approach this is to talk about how your teaching has evolved over time and what kind of methods you've used throughout that time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I started like a lot of people by uh, not really. Um, well, maybe not a lot of people, but a lot of people in my position who, you know, who come into teaching kind of more out of necessity than out of vocation. But I, I, uh, I started, you know, here are, the, here are your materials, go through these points, get to this point by the end of the lesson, you know. So I was really kind of basically pretty much a glorified person reading out the book, you know, reading out the materials. 
and giving a lot of feedback, uh, not giving too much feedback um, because I didn't really have the knowledge then. Um, that really changed um, after I did my CELTA, which I did in South Korea. And I loved, I loved doing the CELTA. It was uh, a fantastic experience for me. And I learned a lot. And I always say that doing the CELTA was the thing that, it was a transition from being someone who taught English to becoming an English teacher. Uh, that was where that occurred, when it really opened me up to just to think in different ways about how I teach. It, and and it's, I stopped thinking about myself and I started thinking about the students. And my focus really became on what the students were doing in the lesson, not what am I doing in the lesson, because that's not really important. So I, yeah, so that was a big moment for me. And then uh, I, I had another, another, the next big moment was probably uh, about a year or so after that when I discovered Teaching Unplugged, um, the approach to English teaching, uh, uh, which is the book on Teaching Unplugged is written by uh, Scott Thornbury and Luke Meddings, uh, which I highly recommend. And it, um, but what I really discovered it through blogs and articles. And if anyone doesn't know, the, the, the uh, Teaching Unplugged approach uh, is, is normally associated with um, it's very materials light um, and it's conversation driven and uh, it's, uh, it deals with emergent language. So you don't go into the classroom saying, you know, today we're going to talk about, you know, the present perfect. But instead you might go in and you're more like, I mean, you could go in with an article or a topic of conversation and then see what comes out of it. Um, and then you deal with the, the language that's necessary as it emerges. So if they have a particular issue, maybe it's something that they're doing wrongly or that then or something that they're lacking, then you can teach that uh, to them as they need it. Um, a lot of people seem to think that you need experience to do this. I don't necessarily think that's true. I think you need confidence, which normally comes with experience. But I think you have to be quite confident in your ability as a teacher to do it. Um, but what I found for me as the big influence for me was really that it um, it changed the way I thought. Um, I could see lessons um, in a more, not as a kind of, you know, in a, as a strict set, like a lesson plan with a strict set of rules to follow. It made me much more loose, freer. I was much, much better at sort of following it as things went. So even now I don't, you know, teach in a strictly 100% unplugged way all the time but I kind of dip in and out all the time. So I might be doing a book, I might be doing a course book lesson, but then something happens in the classroom and I'm able to, res to respond to that as it happens and think, okay, that is an important thing that we need to deal with and I know how to deal with that. So it was really important for my, uh, for my thinking of, uh, you know, for how I approached my teaching, really, really important. And then since then, I've, you know, there's been other things that have come along and there are so many different things for us to, to think about, the using of technology, the lexical approach, um, flipped learning, uh, you know, so many, so many different things for us to, to, to consider. The last thing I've been really thinking about is the use of first language and translation, which um, I've been really influenced by Philip Kerr's work and his book that he wrote. Um, and how that's been completely sort of neglected in recent years and about how it should uh, probably be reintroduced uh, in, in the right way of course i'm not suggesting we go back to grammar tra translation but definitely you know, i think there should be more first language use in the classroom and i've been doing my own research on introverted learners and that's been really interesting as well and i think there are some problems with communicative language teaching and how it deals with uh, introverted uh, students so I'm always there's always something new coming along there's always something new to consider and think about and that's one of the reasons why I love being a teacher because uh, uh, or being a language teacher specifically because it's kind of messy um, we don't have a defined method this is how you do it we don't really know exactly how people learn a language in the best way and there are so many variables a class in the morning can be completely different to a class in the evening and I just feel like I'm on my toes all the time so it's very rewarding for me. Great. And um, how, how do you find the time to, to do all of this? Uh, 
<laughs> well, um, I, uh, I, how do I find the time? Uh, recently, because I moved from one country to another, I've had the time, but I, it's kind of my hobby in a way, you know, like it's, uh, it's something that I feel in one, in one, one, in one way, I feel like it's my responsibility as a teacher that I have to keep up to date with what's what's going on, and I have to stay um, on top of developments uh, as much as I can. Um, and that, you know, that doesn't mean I have to be reading all the latest academic research in second language acquisition because that's just not really feasible. Um, but it does, you know, it does mean that I can uh, read blogs where people are writing about these things and and you know try and read books and 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 um, you know nowadays with especially with webinars uh and and hopefully interviews like this um there are um lots of opportunities for people to learn about new new ideas new things and just stay up to date and it can be you know like webinars can be organized by uh, big organizations like you know oxford university press cambridge university press the british council you know people like that but then you also have like local teaching associations and um you know local groups like here in brazil we have a group called brelt um which is like the brazilian spin-off of elt chat and they do their own webinars using google hangout like this and so there are these opportunities online I mean, there were just countless opportunities online for you to kind of train yourself um, for free, um, and you can watch, you know, talks by the the, the brightest and the best, uh, famous the famous speakers, the Jeremy Harmers, Hugh Dellers, and uh, Scott Thornberrys. But then you can also watch talks by people you've never heard of who've been given the chance by someone, and you're just as likely to learn something from those people as you are from the big names. So I think. Um, yeah, it just, it, you know, it, it's just so interesting to me and, and I, it's just become part of my life. Um, so it's, it's just, I don't know, it just, I find the time. I might be watching, in the past I probably used to watch the Premier League. Now I kind of have the Premier League on quietly in the background and, uh, and I have my laptop in front of me as I'm, I'm watching an online conference or something. So you just, when it's your passion, you just find a way. Great. Love it. And um, where can people contact you? Uh, well, my blog, uh, my website is uh, theteacherjames.com. That's theteacherjames.com. Uh, and through there, you can find links to um, contact me on Facebook, uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, and, you know, all of those usual places. They're all, they're all there. Uh, Facebook and Twitter are the ones I use mostly. I have a, a Facebook page. Um, for my blog and and for things like this which i'll share um which is the teacher james blog uh, uh on facebook but you can contact you can connect with me as well personally uh uh yeah i'm i'm always open to hear from people it's always very nice so yeah it's all through my website it's probably the easiest way Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today. I've learned a lot and I'm sure uh, everyone watching has too. So yeah, thank you again. No, my pleasure. I hope it hasn't been too overwhelming with all of this, all of this stuff that I've been talking about. It makes <laughs> me feel tired with all the, the stuff I have to do. Yeah, it's, well, uh, it's, it's been spread oh. out over a few years. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you build your systems, you get things down a little bit in certain areas. But um, no, it's yeah. all been very interesting. So yeah, thank you. No, thank you, Jack. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Yep. Speak soon. Okay. Bye-bye.